Um, you know, I think I, I, I think I didn't know until you spoke, Lonnie, that this was going to be your first time sitting oh. through it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, look, I, you, uh, I, I wasn't going to come because I thought perhaps it was going to be so much about how to do what I do, and I figure I'm in a room with a lot of directors. And I'm doing what I'm doing because that's what I can do. And you all have different processes, and I recognize that. But it wasn't. It was about what a hell of a marvelous life you can have doing what we all do. And I, Lonnie, Tommy, everybody involved, I, uh, it's not remotely what I expected. Not that I didn't know you'd do a terrific job, but but it, it so far exceeds anything. For one thing, I don't remember 35% of those. <laughs> I, 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 I don't remember those things happening. And there's a good reason, because it's in the, in the, in the piece. Uh, I, I really don't look back. Uh, tonight is the first time I've ever looked back at my life. I, I take a lot of pictures and never look at them again. I have scrapbooks I've never seen. We just send them off to the public library at Lincoln Center, and, wow. and there they get mangy, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe somebody looks through them. But, you know, it really is about the future. And right now it's about the future. But I I don't, what can I say? I don't want to be, seem falsely modest. Hell, I had a life. I'm having one. But I, I really... I really think you did me more than proud. I, I would like to have. So I just have a few questions, and then I'm sure there um, are are questions uh, that other folks would like to ask. And I, I would like to. The depth of your relationship is kind of extraordinary, and I'd like to talk about that. But I want to first have a couple questions about the making of this piece, um, and in particular, I want to talk about the the framing. Like how you got into, uh, you say at one point towards the end something about, you know, in the 70 years so far that just rolls off your tongue, how, just 70 years. But how did you I'm take, lying, you know, 64 years. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, how did you, how did you find a way in? How did you find this narrative? And were there other narratives maybe that you thought about that you discarded or how could you possibly have taken how'd you get to that well the um the notion was that um what does a director do and that we would reflect in each aspect of the job a different show of house which seemed like an organizing principle other than uh instead of and then i directed and then i directed and then i directed which i thought would be monotonous and um there were certain shows like Cabaret and Follies that were seminal and that I wanted to concentrate on. Also, I'd seen them all. Um, you know, there's so much more that's left out that, you know, I, I look at, oh, Tommy and I always go, but we didn't and we could have and what about? And um, so I think we organized it that way because we needed a principle. And, um, you know, Hal at the beginning of Hal's book, Contradictions, he said he wrote it to cut down on his mail because people kept asking him questions about, and I thought, how many galas have we all sat through where someone said, what does a director do? And it's the most boring question and they're not really that interested in the answer. Um, and I thought, we need something that explains that and what better way to do it than through Hal's career. Um, just before it goes any longer, I just need to acknowledge um, the theater is a collaboration, but there's n nothing I've ever experienced like the collaboration of a documentary and the people here made this documentary. There's a really good reason why the Writers Guild doesn't allow you to say a film by a director because it's a lie. It's a film by a lot of people. And um, I want to acknowledge our editor, Russ Green, who's sitting right there. <laughs> who came up with ideas of organizing this material that floor me as I watch it. They're not mine, they're Russ's. Our writer and producer, Tommy Thompson, right there. <laughs> Angelique George, where are you? She did all the animations, oh, which are great. so glorious. 
Um, thank you so much. Um, who am I? Who am I leaving out? Editor, writer, Angelique. Um, uh, anyway, if I've left you out, uh, it's a it takes a village, and I'm just a part of it. And um, so, to answer, thank you, guys, um, beyond all measure. Uh, but the, the idea was just to find an organizing principle because the truth is, since the 50s, Hal either directed, produced, produced and directed every important and or influenced every important musical since 1955 or four or three. And that's including Hamilton and all the rest of it. They wouldn't exist if it weren't for his work. And so that's a huge kind of oof to try and deal with in 80 minutes. But um, uh, we figured out that that, I, I, we thought that that was an organizing principle that might uh, organize the material. Now, of course, you just saw it for the first time. I, I, favorite moment. I mean, I'd love to hear if you have a favorite moment or if you have one that I have a favorite moment. No, uh, no, 80 minutes, 80 favorite moments. I was, 80 favorite. I was just stunned uh -huh. by the whole thing. I, I, it, it's so, so articulate, so well organized, and mostly it does what I would have wanted it to do. It tells a lot of people to try to make a life in the field. You know, my favorite moment is the Follies sequence, but it's really the end of the Follies sequence. If I had to find my favorite moment within my favorite moment, when you pull back away from the Broadway baby and your your last, it, it that whole sequence is so eloquent. I mean, it's well, really a lot of that is Russ Green. So um, uh, gorgeous when Russ figured out, and this is just one of his brilliant moments, um, I think Tommy would agree, to go from Hal saying your life needs to be more than your career, your family, and then to go into his life with Judy and to underscore it with being alive. Um, that's Russ Green. So uh, I'd love to take credit for it, but it's not mine. It's his. Beautiful. Um, so you talked about your letter to Hal. Yeah. And I can sort of see the opening of you or the documentary on your life, which instead of playing with toy soldiers, you're going to be writing your letter to Hal. Um, but I'd love to, Hal, talk about your relationship with Mr. Abbott and what you learned from Mr. Abbott and also what you think Mr. Abbott saw in you. I have no idea what anybody, I have no idea what anybody saw in me, honestly. I'm not kidding. Uh, you're so worried and nervous and hanging by your fingernails to the job you luckily, luckily gotten into. But I'll tell you, uh, I do know what I learned from him. Uh, and I, th I think I can very simply tell you that he thought I was smart, he thought I was mm -hmm. ambitious, and, uh, and I was good company. So we actually mm -hmm. went to Cuba six years in a row on, on our Christmas holidays. Uh, the two of us. He was a great dancer, so he'd always have some terrific uh, Latin dancer in tow, and then she'd bring a date for me, and I couldn't dance. He actually <laughs> sent me to Pedro and Alda's dance studio on Broadway and <laughs> to learn the merengue. <laughs> but he liked my company. I'm supposed to give you. I'm supposed to switch people. Okay. Oh, I didn't put it on. But you're all right. Okay. Anyway, um, I, 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 from him, I got discipline. Mm -hmm. He is, he, he uh, suffers no fools. He won't indulge anybody. Anybody who thinks, oh, I'm in the theater and I can have a hissy fit is not going to be in his theater. Uh, rehearsals start at 10. He's there at 10 of 10. Uh, it's all like that. And yet, it's not a machine, it's just a job. Mm -hmm. It happens to be an artistic job, and he happens to be an artistic fellow. But he deals with it like a job, and he has all that responsibility. And I learned that very quickly from him. I learned, uh, when, when we produced the pajama game, I uh, would panic. And for the first three or four shows, I had a panic few days. Oh my God, this is in trouble. This is not going to be hit. And I would absent myself. Just 
for some reason, I was not there. While I got over my panic and then came in with a smile on my face. Uh, I learned something right away. I, I knew he was so, that he was that good at solving problems. But when you start working, in this case as a producer, the show gets staged and there are a whole lot of things you don't care for, you think are trouble, that you think are wrong. And I would make a list. Sometimes there were a hundred things on that list, but you don't open your mouth. You watch because you're in, you're in the company of only two directors, Jerry Robbins and, and George Abbott, and they'll, they can't do it all in one day. They can't do it all in five days. So you shut up, and one, the next day you come in, and you get to cross off three things that are on your list, mm -hmm. and the next day more. And suddenly you find yourself near the end of the road on the way to Broadway, and this happened with Pajama Game, and there was only one thing on my list, and I hated the last scene. I thought it was another style entirely. I thought it was a, a, a sort of twee advertising from a review, not from a gutsy, earthy musical. So uh, we had Robbins and Abbott in a, and I in a room, and I said, uh, well, I have only one thing. I started with 100, but I have only one, and I hate the end of this show. Well, the show was a smash. There were long lines in Boston <laughs> waiting for tickets. The, uh, the uh, scalpers were having a heyday. The whole thing was... So Jerry said, what are you talking about? You've got a big smash. Your first show's a big smash. And I said, I don't care. I really, I, I, I'm driven out of the theater every night when the last sequence comes on. So Abbott said, gee, he seems passionate about this, Jerry. <laughs> and, uh, and Jerry said, well, how, much, how many hours for rehearsal do we have? And the stage manager said, you have five hours on Sunday, and that's the end before New York. So very disagreeably, Robin said, all right, I'll do it. What do you want it to be? I said, I want it to be the obvious a party in a pajama factory, or, or take it to the nightclub, the cheesy nightclub, or Hernando's Hideaway that they all go to. But let's just have a party and let everybody be silly. And they have uh, rhyme couplets, which they did as advertisements. I said, use the rhyme couplets. Let them all just show off for each other. Well, in the five hours he did it, we put it in, and I was happy. <laughs> That's a great story. So, Lonnie, can you tell us what you learned from Hal? Oh yeah, sure. It's it's real. It's real simple, and it's just respect. Mm -hmm. um, that Hal respects everybody in the building. The stage door man is the same as Angela Lansbury. Is the same as Stephen Sondheim. Uh, we're all there doing it together. We're all needed, and. Um, Everyone is to be treated the same and with the same dignity, and that is something that I hope I have uh, taken on. I, I, I don't have his smarts, and I don't have his talent, but I can do that. I can treat people well. He's one of the best performers I ever had in a show. He really is. Uh, uh, I wish he were doing more performing, but uh, he's doing directing, for God's sake. <laughs> Well, I, I have to say, one of the things that's really important to us at SDC and at, particularly at the foundation is this idea of legacy and mentorship. And um, I know how you, you once told me that you always try to have someone in the room that's younger than you for you to learn from. Well, yeah, well, actually, that I learned from Abbott. Abbott had a, a lot of the, uh, you know, a, a, a very esteemed designer, uh, an orchestrator and so on. But I noticed early on, well, we were very young, I noticed that he always wanted a component that was very young. And they would learn from him, discipline and, and uh, uh, courage, and he would learn from them what was topically uh, uh, appealing at a particular time. So really, of, of the shows that I did with him, we talked him into the pajama game. He thought it was a terrible idea. Uh, I had 
uh, I Sondheim, Gelb part, and Shevelov played a funny thing. Mm -hmm. And he walked out at the end of the first act and said, I've really got to go to the country, gentlemen. And everybody went, Ugh. this was an audition to do the show. And uh, I called him in the country and I said, you really hated it. He said, oh yeah, I really, it's nothing. You shouldn't be doing that. And I said, uh, I'm gonna send you the script. Short line bus went to the Catskills with the script in an envelope. And I said, if on Monday, having read the script, you refuse to do this show, it'll be your loss. And Monday he said, you're dead right, I'm on. And that was it. But uh, that is a quality of Abbott's. He, he is not, he does not stick to conventionally to, oh, I said it, so I mean it. You can say something and really put your muscle behind it, your reputation behind it. But then somebody says, you know, that's not really, and you say, you know, you're right. And that's the end of that. You have to be that open-minded. Mm -hmm. And he did a wonderful job with that show. Well, one last question for you, Lonnie, and then we'll open mm -hmm. it up. Is there, what's this, what, what like broke your heart to have to leave on the cutting room floor? Oh God, there's, um, there's, there's so much, right? Um, one story I really, really love um, was that in uh, Damn Yankees, they opened, and um, Hal didn't think it was good enough that the show was good enough. And I guess you got okay reviews, but not great reviews. Oh, no, no. We, we, we got pretty, pretty 50, 40. 50, 40, not great. <laughs> but I loved that opening night, he called his collaborators and he said, we can do better. Mm -hmm. It's a better story. Do it. May I tell it? <laughs> <laughs> we should have included it. No, uh, I, there was a party. And I left the party knowing that the reviews had not been very good. And I, I went home and I thought, it, it, but we had a hell of an advance because of the pajama game, which was 12 months exactly a year before. So there was an advance and every, a buzz, but it, it got slammed by the important critics. So I didn't sleep. And then about five in the morning, I called Abbott, and he he answered the phone. I said, I'm so sorry, you're sleeping. He said, no, I was waiting to call you. <laughs> and I said, shall we go back into rehearsal? He said, exactly what I think. Now, what do we do this? Blah, blah. So wh you call the authors, see if you can get the stage manager, and let's meet at Dinty Moore's, which was next door to the 46th Street Theater, which is now the Richard Rogers. And we met there. For a late breakfast, and we took the uh, cast list, and we divided up all the, the uh, members of the cast, and everyone called until we could reach every single person and say, "Be at the theater at two o'clock." Then we decided what to do, and in that long breakfast, we took a number out of the first act, put a number from the second act in the first act cut 20 minutes, and change the end of the show. Uh, totally, because Gwen Verdon at the end of that show, she had been a witch who turned into a Gwen Verdon. And at the end of the show, she went back to being a witch. And the audience just hated that, obviously. They, it's silly that we didn't realize, but of course we turned her back into Gwen Verdon. But all that happened between two and 5.30 or something, in the afternoon, and the show was off and running. That's, that's a great, great story. story. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that's, I mean, obviously, with the tech, technology of moving sets and everything, we can't ever do anything near that. However, the notion after you open to say, we can do better and let's go work on it, um, I don't think anybody does that. And uh, I admire that. And um, I think we all should have the courage to say well, we can do better. There's a very famous show called Wish You Were Here mm -hmm. that Joshua Logan, who's a great director and someone I got to know very well, and he's the fellow who did all the amazing uh, inspirational stuff on South Pacific. Uh, uh, he opened Wish You Were Here, and it was a disaster. And he kept working on it from opening on for weeks, fixing, fixing, fixing. And in 
in company with an advertising campaign, and he turned it into a smash hit. So people did those things. So questions? Yes. All right. Yep. Oh. Um, Oh, thank you. Hal, thank you for the career. You don't even know how much you influenced it. And that's true of many of us. Um, I had the pleasure of working with you as an actor, Chuck Abbott. Oh, you probably Lord. can't. Oh, see, please, do I ever know? Well, <laughs> I regret that I did not do what you did with George Abbott who I'm not related to, <laughs> and yeah, well, what- There are lo a lot of Abbots around, and they're not related to I know, well, it's not <laughs> even my first name. The uh, <laughs> fellow I know was a producer, Michael Abbott, and he just chose it because he liked the George Abbott's name. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, besides the fact that I want to thank you for the career that you inspired for many of us, I want to share with you that I went so far as to ask for a meeting um, I had one week off from the national tour, and you said, oh, yes, have him come in. And I sat in your outer office, and the reason I became terrified to talk with you was that you, it was the night after the opening of 1776. And, of course, that season you had uh, Zorba. And you were angry as to how good 1776 was. And when I was permitted to come into your office, you vented some of your anger. Oh, God, did I really? <laughs> yes, you did. Whoa, that should be on film. <laughs> I don't recall that at all. This gentleman, by the way, played the MC for a yeah. long time in the and National the... Company of Cabaret. And he was wonderful. Yeah. Though I'm pictured on Joe Masteroff's page of all of the shots of Cabaret, I'm also named under Robert Salvio, so I have to say not all those pictures are mine. Um, anyway, thank you for the career that you have greatly influenced. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate it. Stage lore has it that the show is not a hit out of town until that opening number was written. Is that true? Uh, yeah, except I really can. Uh, that's the, that stage lore. And of course, the opening number was thrilling. But really what happened was we opened at the National in Washington. And the original, uh, oh, we, we had a, I, I should back up. We had a gypsy run through in New York a few days before we went to Washington, and it was a triumph. The audience adored it. Then we went to Washington, and uh, the leading critic in Washington, the headline was, Mr. Abbott, close it. So that wasn't good, and certainly not good for business. So Zero Mostel and Jack and all these people played the show, a real heavy farce comedy, uh, for four weeks to no more than three or four rows of people in the National Theater, no laughter, they kept the timing, they just, they were professionals. Now, I, I think, was instrumental in, to some degree, in keeping that mood going because I'd had the gypsy run through a week earlier and I could come back maybe four times a week and say, remember the gypsy run through. When we get to New York, it's gonna be just like that. Now, the show opened, this is a lesson just about putting together a show with a wonderful number called Love is in the Air. And that seems to me part of what the show was about, but it wasn't the major part. The major part was Zero and, and those comics. Uh, so uh, it was decided we had to have a new number. Uh, Jerry was in uh, California getting an Academy Award for West Side Story. So I called him and I said, help. And he said, what's going on? I said, so he had just been fired earlier from the film of West Side Story. But nevertheless, he and 
uh, uh, Robert Wise shared Academy Awards. They each got an Academy Award. So he got up to receive his Academy Award, and he thanked Bobby Griffith and Hal Prince, not anybody who'd done the film at all, <laughs> just these two guys who were waiting in Washington for him to get on a plane, which is exactly what he did, and come to Washington. Uh, he did a dazzling job. First of all, he, he pushed or pulled out of Steve one of Steve's great opening numbers, Comedy Tonight. But Jerry's almost the only person I, I know who could really mine that for the gold that was in that number and make it a hilarious opening. And all, you sort of thought, oh, I, I've just had a marvelous evening and it was only 10 minutes old. But Jerry got that number out of Steve and then he staged the number. And of course, it made a big difference. However, here's a surprise. It did not go into the show in Washington. It did not go into the show until the second preview in New York on Broadway at the Alvin, now the Neil Simon. And the truth is, the first preview went very well. But of course, that number really put it through the roof. Can I ask you a question? What was Abbott and Jack Cole was the choreographer? How did you negotiate saying, Robbins is going to stage this, not you. It was not any problem at all. Jack Cole was a brilliant choreographer, but he was rather famous, I only found out subsequently, for doing one number in a show or one number in a film. One glorious, incredible, imaginative number, and then he'd either lose interest or what. So he did, <laughs> he did The House of Marcus Lycus. It was really terrific. And then he went to the bar next door, and he didn't do anything else. So, and I really liked him. He's a grand guy and a, and a brilliant dancer besides. But in truth, he couldn't have cared less. <laughs> and Abbott didn't care that he didn't stage that number? That, oh, no. Abbott didn't care about those things. It's we who hired him. Uh, and and uh, I, I would do the scenery on the Abbott shows because he didn't care who the designer was. He cared where the door was, where's the table, uh, uh, how do we, do we step up here, do we, that sort of thing. But he just wanted the roadmap uh, like a, a plot, but he didn't care of the aesthetics particularly. And so I grabbed that for myself and uh, I did a lot of set decorating right away from Pajama Game, right, though the designers were, brilliant, the, the Eckerts. Nevertheless, uh, it was, uh, he didn't care about that. He didn't necessarily have a, an opinion who the choreographer should be. Uh, he left those things to the producers and he respected us. We were very, very wet behind the ears, but he respected us to make these decisions. And it turns out he was right. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard you say that. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Hi. Ah. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Um, with uh, me as an uh, as an arts educator and musician and dancer, I definitely enjoyed uh, knowing and seeing your works and knowing that. You are a true authentic artist who brings something to the table that um, is not found in the arts arena, uh, especially the performing arts, where uh, you're taking a piece and you're uh, telling the story so that the actor, so that everybody involved in the show is aware and can see the entire picture. So they can see you down the journey. And, and it's truly, I feel, that's missing now. And so we thank you again for your life, as this gentleman stated as well, and sharing that with us. But where do you see um, that being, since some of it's being lost in the theater world today, well, so and where is it going? I'm glad you asked the question. Um, there's a very, very easy answer of why this isn't being replicated, this life over and over and over again. It's money. Yeah. We got, we raised $250,000 to do Pajama Game. We spent 162000 of that, and we got a beautiful show. 
that show today, replicated exactly as it was before, would cost upwards of $15 million. Now, who were our investors? Wardrobe women, lighting men, uh, stage hands, actors, uh, just friends, because uh, we had 175 investors, and probably the biggest investment was 5,000 bucks, which wouldn't get you anything today uh, on a $15 million budget. And most of, a lot of them uh, put up 500 bucks. The show turned into a big hit. I never had trouble raising money again as a producer. I'd send a letter out and I'd say, we're doing a show, it's uh, uh, Romeo and Juliet, and uh, it's but in modern clothes, and uh, uh, the score will be by Leonard Bernstein, the famous Leonard Bernstein. And then there's this, score, uh, this uh, 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 lyricist whom you won't know named Stephen Sondheim. Uh, the money's coming in very quickly. So as soon as you receive this letter, please call us and tell us whether to count on you. And we raise the money in one day. And we raised the money in one day for every show we did. No one read a script. No one asked who was starring in it. No one did anything. They loved the experience of being part of a Broadway adventure. Now, that's impossible. You want $15 million, you got to get some hedge fund guy who has $15 million to give you, and a wife with an opinion. <laughs> So I stopped producing. <laughs> I really did. I, I thought, no, I can't do this. I, uh, 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 I, I don't know rich people. I actually don't know rich people. So I think it must be a choice my wife and I have made. Uh, so basically, uh, since I didn't know them, uh, I had to be a director for hire. And that's much harder. But the bad thing about the theater is the people who are investing in it, not all of them. Believe me, I don't believe. I think there are people with the same dream I have out there producing and so on. I know they. The people who did Hamilton are dreamers. It took them 12 years to get it on. The same 12 years that we had to get on uh, West Side Story, the fellows who did it. So it, it's hard. These are labors of love, and they didn't capitulate anything. And that's a show that represents someone's dream, and a dream of an idea, and a very unlikely idea, let me say. So it, it's worth everything that's happened to it. The problem is, when you get, when you start to go for 15 million, you're starting to uh, search or beseech people to give you huge chunks of money. And very often, people who give out huge chunks of money, are looking for a return. What they don't know is the theater. The theater is unexpected. It's not something you drill a hole in the ground and oil comes up. Uh, you don't go to Wall Street and bet on something. You, uh, you, you have an artistic, a need to be involved in an artistic enterprise. And to support this, I'm just gonna say one more thing. When we did Pacific Overtures, we'd had a record we'd had. Uh, Follies didn't make any money. Nobody ever complained. They were gr glad to be a part of Follies. But also we thought, well, after Follies, we better do something that pays them back. So we did a little night music. Well, if you can find a show that's less, wow, I'm investing in a little night music. <laughs> you know? But it did pay them back. And that was important to us. We thought we have to keep that balance going. On the other hand, when I wrote the letter and I said, we are going to do a musical about Commodore Perry's incursions on the Japanese society, which has been isolated for 300 years. And what is the cost of acculturation? What did America do? It's getting more and more commercial, right? What did America do <laughs> to pollute the purity of the Japanese experience? 
and then you send that letter out. Oh, and yes, we're doing it in the kabuki style <laughs> because Hal and Steve are going to Japan for two weeks and Hal will learn something that was took 3,000 years <laughs> to do. And then come back and do it in that style. <laughs> and, oh, we're not finished. We're doing it with all Japanese actors. Oh, yes, and no women. All the women's roles will be played by Japanese men. And then we raise the money. <laughs> well, we raised it in one day. The show ran five months. It lost all its money. And everybody is still proud to have been an investor in that show. That's hard to replicate today. Yes. Hi. For one thing, the movie wasn't long enough. <laughs> oh. This is a um, uh, perspective. In about 1971, I think, I paid $1.50 to see Company at the Amundsen Theater in LA with George Shakiris yep. and Jane Russell. Right. A few years later, I paid $5 to sit in the very last row of the brand new Schubert Theater in LA, which has since been torn down. For Follies. For Follies. And I will never forget it. We've done Follies, Chuck and I, Chuck directing me playing Buddy, about five times, I think. Uh -huh. And thank you for believing in it. Well, I, I, it's one of my favorite shows, you know. Uh, there's a huge poster, that poster of the lady with the cracked face. Uh, uh, in my office, it's the dominant poster. So I, so my wife was right. I, you know, I, I, was it a success? You bet. Was it a flop? You bet. Well, I just want to wrap up by saying thank you and sort of circling back to this idea of mentor and leg legacy that we have as part of our DNA. Thank God. At the foundation, and and to say there is something that I've learned both of you, and I didn't know Mr. Abbott, but I think it's incredible, and a lot of people in this room have it as well, which is there's something about the way how you see people. And I said this to Lonnie earlier, he sees people. I think probably when you walked in the room, Mr. Abbott actually paused and saw you, which I think in this kind of, also in the crazy world today, we're all looking ahead for the next moment and don't pause to sort of say. Laura, you're right. Obviously, I couldn't answer why he chose to be terrific mm -hmm. to me, but he did. And obviously, he saw something in me. I'm going to tell one anecdote before we quit. Okay. May I? Of I course you can. This is, a <laughs> this is a very short one, but this will give you the other side of me that's not revealed in this great film. Uh, Abbott... Before I went to Broadway, he I was in his office, boy. I would change the water. And I uh, uh, put stamps on mail and all that sort of thing. I delivered things. And then I went from that to uh, things he would assign me. And then one day he said, I'm going to try television because that's what I was uh, uh, there for. He was seeing if he, there was a place in television for him. And he signed a contract with NBC. This is 1948. Uh, and uh, to do something called the Hugh Martin Show. And it was a half hour variety on Sunday nights at seven. And Hugh Martin was a great composer and a great arranger, a vocal arranger. And he had, assuming he had a living room where, uh, uh, oh, this is politically incorrect, God knows where Butterfly McQueen was the maid, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, th there would people come and visit. Uh, uh, Kay Ballard would come. Oh, she'd just drop in and sing two songs and then leave. And it was like that. But it was very rudimentary early days of variety shows on television. He wrote the first one. He directed the first one. And he said, you know, I really I don't, don't love this a lot. So he assigned a team of very famous writers in California to write the second show, which was to be delivered uh, by the following weekend so he could go into rehearsal on Monday. On uh, Friday, and he'd, he'd gone to the country. On Friday, I was in the office, and the script was delivered from California. 
I opened it. I, I wasn't cheating. I just opened it to read it, which he would have been approved of. And uh, I thought it was ghastly. And I thought he would just hate it. What was going to happen on Monday morning when I heard that from his office? So I went home and I wrote the script, a new script. And I sat on it. And I heard on Monday the noise from his office. Hal, I came in. He said, oh, God, the script. He says, have you read it? I said, well, yeah, I have, actually. He said, God, it's awful. What am I supposed to do? Well, I guess I have to write another script. And I said, Mr. Abbott, I wrote a script over the weekend. Would you like to read it? And he said, yes, he read it. And it was in the show the second time. And then he said, I like the script so much, you direct the show. And uh, I was still not on a salary. I was, still, I was still on the first six months of you know, working for nothing. But uh, uh, that's, that was obviously very good for our relationship. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, that, that's just one more enlightenment. Mm -hmm. uh, the show went well, but the cast couldn't bear me because I was too energetic. And to, I always felt that when I went, that watch it story, that I always felt that when I walked into a room, there was a big block of energy pushing people against the wall as I went by. And I thought, so that's why I wrote watch it, because I, I could see that happening. These people like you, but they're going to not like you for long. Well, <laughs> when I went to, the, to NBC at 104th Street, way up, uh, up in the Heights, I uh, I directed this thing, and uh, I I did I couldn't suppress the energy thing because we were on a very big deadline, you mm -hmm. know, five days and then a camera or so, and so they came to Abbott at the end of the week and said we we can't we can't handle it. I mean, he's just he makes us all very nervous. <laughs> which well, he was very nervous. You see, I was very nervous. So. Uh, he said, well, what are you going to do? And he said, well, we won't do the show if he directs it. So he said, so you're asking me, it's it's you or, or it's Hal or you guys? And he said, well, I'll take Hal. And the show went off the air. Wow. That was loyalty. That completely. And, uh, and, uh, and, he, and they were right. Oh, boy, were they right. I know how hard it was to, to have that undisciplined energy uh, shoving you around. <laughs> well, I I'm think still we'd here. all welcome that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much.